Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Scoop TV. We have a very special guest with us, Mr. Simon Haig uh, from Ireland. And welcome to Scoop TV, Mr. Simon. How are you today? No, very good, and thanks very much. It's great to connect with you. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Mr. Simon Haig is an author, and he's a coach, and he's a growth strategist, and he's a keynote speaker. So it's a, he has uh, many uh, achievements in his uh, career. So we'd like to know more about your, you. Please uh, tell us about um, your career and uh, uh, what you do right now, please. Okay, so I'll try and be quick because it's been a long career. So I started life in the UK. I was born in London and I spent the first 13 years of my career as a commercial lawyer. I was a technology commercial lawyer. Uh, I worked in the UK. I worked in Ireland where I live now. I also spent 10 years in Australia. I was a lawyer over there. And um, so for the first 13 years, I was a commercial lawyer. And then for the, the last 13 years, you can divide that into two halves. For the first six years of the last 13 years, I moved from law. I did an MBA when I was in Australia. Uh, I lived there for 10 years and I ended up becoming a CEO for an American company in Australia. So I moved from law into business, CEO. And then seven years ago, I decided to work for myself. So I set up my own consulting business. Um, and the last seven years, I've been in Australia for, and I've been back in Ireland for the last three. And today, what I, I'm re referred to as the growth strategist. So I help organizations and leaders and businesses and entrepreneurs with four aspects of growth, business growth, leadership growth, brand growth, and mindset growth. So four aspects. I call them the four pillars of growth. And... Um, and so I work with, so I do that through either coaching or consulting or advisory work or mentoring. Uh, I lecture, I do executive education programs. Right now, I'm actually mentoring uh, an executive in India, in um, Mumbai. She contacted me on LinkedIn and I'm doing some mentoring with her. And um, so I love the work I do, but it's all about helping organizations and leaders uh, match their confidence with their capability. We all have capabilities, right? But yet so many people around the world lack the confidence. And uh, I was talking to her about this and she was saying that in India, you know, there's, you know, a lot of people with capabilities, but they're lacking confidence. And I think it's the same around the world. So for me, it's about helping individuals and organizations find their true direction and, and allow them to grow. So that's what I do. It's very nice. Very, I mean, you've been uh, in the law profession and on the uh, the business and on the mentoring for roles. Yes. So very nice. So, so yeah, I want to start with one uh, topic today. I mean, it's a very stressful environment, and everybody. Uh, the first topic is everybody talking about the health, and the second topic immediately goes uh, switches to the economy and the business. Yeah. Uh, right now, so. So what do you think, I mean, a true leader or a, a business person should be focusing on uh, during these hard uh, times? So. Okay. So the, the, the way to answer that is that, um, you know, you said a business leader. Well, businesses are governed by, I call them the three R's of business. If you can imagine a three-legged stool, you know, a, th a, le a stool with three legs, each business is governed by three R's, revenue, risk, and reputation. So every business needs to make money, revenue, every business to, it needs to manage risk, and every business needs to develop and maintain its reputation. And so that's really important to think of it like a triangle, revenue, risk, reputation. And um, so I think every business leader and owner needs to think of those, they need to have that triangle on their desk or their, their wall in front of them and think, is what I'm doing today supporting each of those legs of the, of the stool or the triangle equally? So if you focus just on revenue, particularly in these difficult times where, you know, people are very sensitive right now around the world and that, you know, there's, you know, COVID is a, you know, a massive change in the world order. And, you know, there are race issues in the States and around the world and there are political issues and there's a lot of confusion in the world. So if you just focus on making money and revenue, but don't look at your reputation, right? That stall is going to fall over. 
And likewise, if you just look at your reputation, but don't manage your risk, that stall is going to fall over. So I think the best leaders really need to think of everything they do in terms of revenue, risk and reputation every day. Right. And, um, and I think, you know, I think you need to be, I think leaders need to be, I also, I like to make things sound simple. So I talk about the three C's of leadership. Leaders today need to be calm. They need to be confident, but they also need to be courageous. So, you know, for example, some businesses are going to fail. They are going to fail. Some businesses need to um, lay people off. Some business needs to reduce costs. So you need to be courageous as a leader to make those decisions, but you need to be to do that. And I suppose there's a fourth C as well, which is compassionate. You can make strong decisions, but you need to do them in a compassionate, calm way. And um, so I think the three-legged stool of revenue, risk, reputation, but the three or four C's of leadership are critically important in these times. So very nice. I mean, very well, I mean, uh, uh, articulated uh, the needs, I mean, what are critical components of this success? I mean, staying afloat in the business right now. Yeah, uh, yeah. Are you in general also, that's fine, but especially in, during these tough times, it is more important right now. Absolutely. So, yes, guys. So coming back to the, uh, your career and then your uh, this thing, when you say the growth strategy, uh, the growth strategist, so what, why do you think, I mean, people uh, or companies uh, need a third party consultant like you to help them and understand and analyze where they are and how they can grow? So why, yes, so it's a little a different question. I mean, but yeah, I really appreciate if you can help us out in understanding that. Okay, so, that, so that's an important question. I think the first answer is that... Uh, Nobody has all the t- tools success. success. I, I mean, I have my own business. I've also been an entrepreneur and I failed in business as well. Like, so, so I think it's very important to get a second pair of eyes, to get a second opinion on where you are in your business. And, and I think the best coaches, they don't, tell, they don't tell clients what to do. They ask questions. I think, I think it's so important as a coach. So that's one thing I do. I do coaching, consulting, training, mentoring, but I try my hardest to ask as many questions as possible of my clients because often business owners are so busy and I've been the same. I've run, you know, my own, uh, you know, luxury goods businesses and my own, you know, domestic product businesses. And you're so busy focusing on the day to day that, um, that you're not look you're not asking yourself the obvious question. So I think that's the real value of having a coach or consultant. Um, so for example, you know, if, you know, I, I talk about, you know, in the, in the whole area of, of running a business, the whole area of maximizing your business opportunities. And I talk about the seven P's of deal making or business development. So the first one is, you know, are you looking at the principles? Do you know what negotiation is? Do you know what selling is? Do you actually know how to maximize value? And then the second P then is, um, uh, do you have the right power equation in your business? So are you leveraging your networks? Are you leveraging um, your um, information, your hierarchy within an organization or a region? The third P then is players. Do you have the right people on your team? Then the fourth then is performance. Are you performing well enough as a business? And so on, so on, so on. The, the seven Ps. I wrote a book called Deal Making for Corporate Growth and How to Be a Better Deal Closer. So the seven Ps are laid out. Um, but I think just to summarize, I think it's so important for business leaders to have that second pair of eyes, just to nudge them and ask them questions about whether they're going in the right direction. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? So it's critically important. So very nice. And let's say, uh, I mean, the second pair of eyes is a very uh, uh, important thing, which is I, appre- I appreciate you bringing that one. And see, most of the businesses, I mean, I mean, uh, when they start the business, I mean, they, they, when they do the business plan, they have an idea and, and, and uh, they are more um, energetic, uh, energetic in the beginning. I mean, uh, when they go down the path, I mean, let us say two, I mean, uh, we are uh, two years down the line. I mean, I would say majority of them, I, 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 not everybody, but at least majority of them, they get lost. Uh, and and uh, they will not be, not many p- businesses are successful uh, 
uh, the, down the line. So what, what, what do you think is the main reason for those kind of situations for many of the small businesses or the startups? Okay, so you broke up a little bit there, but, but I got the essence. So one of the reasons, well, there's a whole bunch of reasons why businesses are, um, that, that, you know, they don't, uh, that they're, non, they're not successful. So for example, 80% of startups or small, medium enterprises fail within the first two or three years. And this is why the venture capital industry exists, because venture capitalists know this, right? And they swoop on business owners between two or three years, because the business owners have created intellectual property, they have clients, they've created a brand, but they're exhausted. They're exhausted. So that's why venture capitalists come in. And so to answer your question, I think it's a matter of pacing yourself as a business owner. And the other thing that's very important, I think one of the biggest reasons why businesses fail is I, I talk about um, a pitchfork or, or when you come to a junction in the road and you can either go left or you can go right, okay? I think there's a, I think self-awareness is so important, self and situational awareness. So, so many business owners are deluded, right? They take the left journey, which is deluded. They think that they can do everything. They think that they're going to business is going to be great, but they haven't done all the hard work. They haven't planned. They haven't strategized. They haven't got a second pair of eyes. They haven't really thought about finances. They haven't really thought thoroughly enough about these things. The other route then is positive optimism. Um, you know, like it's, it's, it's real optimism based upon some solid foundation. So you, you've done all the hard work. So I think so many businesses fail because the owners are deluded about success and they haven't really done the hard work of planning. So I think if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Having said all that, as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, it's very easy just to rush. It's very easy to rush and move forward but if you don't plan, if you don't strategize, if you don't set your vision, if you don't look at your purpose, the purpose of every business, every business must have a purpose. And if you don't have a purpose, people aren't going to buy from you. So I think that answers the question that, you know, I think so many business leaders are kind of naive and in a rush to achieve and they're a bit deluded. You need to be smart about the trajectory. Gotcha. It's a, you, you mean to say, I mean, you're, you need to be, have a purpose for your business and then yes. stay focused on those things. Exactly. Going back, to, yeah, going back to the three R's, I mean, the revenue, risk, and then the uh, uh, reputation. reputation. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, revenue, risk, and reputation. I mean, when you talk about revenue, I'm focusing on the revenue for now, for a minute. And then, yeah, no, I mean, uh, it's an important thing. And uh, revenue is, again, driven by the sales. So how important is the sales in the life? I mean, I would say, I, I ask in a different way, sales in the business and also sales in the personal life. So uh, uh, we, I mean, I think, I mean, you need some sales parameter even in the personal life and personal relationships too. So how yep. do you see sales in both the business world and also in the personal life? Sales is the lifeblood of business, right? Sales is the blood the equivalent of human blood for a business. Without sales, without whether you call it sales or business development or deals, it's all the same thing. If a business is not making sales or business deals or business development, it doesn't have any blood. So it's critically, critically important for business. And, uh, and the same in our personal lives. Every day, whether you call it selling ourselves or negotiating, we're actually negotiating our way through life every day. So for, for example, for me to be talking to you today, I had an invitation. I couldn't make the live recording last week because I was busy in the UK dealing with my father. And so I had to negotiate and navigate redoing it with you today, right? And so for business and in our personal lives, we need to have what I call influencing skills. So, and we're actually, human beings are born with the ability to influence to persuade others. So remember when we were children, right? When we were young children and we wanted to get our own way, we used to stamp our feet and we used to cry. All babies and young children stamp their feet and they cry, right? Because they know by doing that, they're going to get something back, right? So human beings are born with an instinct to influence, to persuade. And yet when we go through life, early life and childhood and early out, we lose those skills. We lose those influencing persuasion skills, which are critical for negotiation and sales. And so that's why it's so important. That's why I wrote my two books about how to be a better deal closer. Why, the reason I wrote the book, How to Be a Better Deal Closer, which Marshall Goldsmith has done the forward for, was not really 
just to talk about the me me mechanics of, of, of deal making, the seven Bs. It was really to highlight the personal skills that we all need. We need self-awareness. We need resilience. We need situational awareness. We need to have good networking skills, questioning skills, listening skills. They're the core skills for sales personally and in business. So very nice. So you, you brought in the negotiation skills, another topic. I mean, uh, sales is part of the sales too. Yes. But I mean, what is uh, critical to the negotiation? I mean, in business, I mean, I, and you you brought in the negotiation in multiple uh, dopamine areas, like on the personal life and also the business life. I'm focusing more on the business life. I mean, uh, I mean yep. sometimes we do get uh, desperate, I mean, uh, to close a deal. And uh, the, probably my uh, experience has been when you become desperate, you lose most. Uh, yes. So, I mean, so what do you think, I mean, uh, you know, what is the right way to be composed and, and uh, uh, how do you handle those kind of situations? So I know you need to make a deal. I mean, everybody goes to a table to make a deal for sure. But yeah. how do you uh, close it in a balanced way? Okay. So before I answer that question directly, what you need to make sure as much as you can when you're in business and you're negotiating is you need to do three, you need to do three forms of assessment early in the negotiation and throughout the negotiation. And those three forms of assessment are you constantly need to, number one, you need to assess yourself. How am I coming across? Am I saying too much? Am I saying too little? Do I have all the information at hand? Um, do I really have the best deal closing skills? Do I, do I know what a deal zone is? A deal zone is, so this is the zone of, of deal making. So, you know, there's an opening position, there's a bottom line position, and there's a likely closing position. Do I, do I have an awareness of all those things? So, so you need to constantly analyze yourself. Secondly, you need to be assessing the other side. So when you go into a, a deal making negotiation, does the other person you're talking to really have all the power or are they just somebody junior pretending? Um, do they, do they really want to do the deal? Are they really able to do the deal? Are they sharing as much information with you as they should be? Do they like you? Do they dislike you? Are they messing with you? Are they lying with you? So there's the self situation. Then there's the situ the assessment of the other side and you have to do this all the way through. Right. And then the third area then is you need to assess the situation. So there's a self assessment, other side assessment and situation assessment. So is this so what the self situation assessment means is just before you sign the deal, you say to yourself, is this really the deal that I want to sign? Am I really getting what I need to get? Or could I get more? What if I say, no, I don't want this and risk losing it. Sometimes risk losing it actually is a good result. So, you know, sometimes I've lost deals and I thought that's the end of the world. And yet something better comes along. So I think to answer your question, as a good deal maker and a good negotiator constantly needs to be assessing those three things. It's easier said than done when we're busy in business, right? When you're busy, you just want to do it. But I think we need to force ourselves to slow down and think, am I getting as much information out of all those three areas as possible? So very nice. Thank you. And I want to ask you one more thing. I mean, while, when we make it, uh, try to make, negotiate, I mean, we do uh, tend to give out more information. Uh, 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 sometimes it may come back and bite you. Yeah. Uh, so, so how do we be conscious about, I mean, uh, when to stop and what can we give and what we cannot, what we should talk and what we should not talk? Let me put it that okay. way. That, that's a great question. So I do a lots of training around, around the importance of listening and staying silent, right? And it's funny, the word listen and silent are made up of exactly the same letters in the English language, exactly the same letters, listen and silent, right? And I can see you're smiling. And so if you're a people, so most human beings, when they ask a question, so I'll ask you a question. And if you don't respond, most human beings don't like that awkward silence. So I would say, you know, I would say a question to you. And if you don't respond, I would say to fill the silence, I would say, well, what I meant was, or did you not understand that? The best negotiators or deal makers ask a question and they stay silent. They stay silent. There is such power in silence. And this is across most cultures. If you ask a question, wait for the response. So use silence, use silence strategically. There's so much power in 
what's not said. Um, again, it's easier said than done. You need to understand who you're dealing with. Um, but I think the ability to appreciate communication and use silence and listening skills um, smartly is so important. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I talk about there's a, there's a phrase in, in, Eng, in the English language, loose lips sink ships, loose lips sink ships, right? So, you know, most deals get destroyed when somebody says, basically in a negotiation, never say anything unless you have to say it, right? Never say anything unless you have to say it. And it's easier said than done. If you're a people pleaser, I'm generally a people pleaser. I like people to like me, right? I like it when people like me. So I find it very hard not to talk, very hard to stay silent. But as somebody who trains in negotiation, I'm forcing myself to practice this. So I think, you know, next time any of your viewers or listeners is doing a business deal, just notice yourself. Notice, am I saying too much? If I'm saying too much, stop and, be, and listen. I think that's the key advice I'd give. Very nice. Thank you. You brought in good points on silent and listen and uh, listening and then the uh, loose lips and uh, shrinking uh, sh ships. I mean, the uh, nice uh, phrases to be remembered and then uh, it will tell you what to do or what, what is the internet of uh, those phrases. That's very nice. Good. Um, yeah, sorry, you want to say something? No, I was just going to say I'm good. I'm glad. I'm glad because that's very, very, very important to get that message across. Yes, very nice. Thank you. Uh, going back to the small businesses, I mean, I know many businesses they start to, I mean, a dream uh, big. I mean, people do say that, I mean, you need to dream big and then they need to start the business. They do start and they do work hard. But um, what we've seen, and I just said, I mean, 80% of businesses fail and even 20% uh, of the businesses with their successful they are in a, they will kind of a uh, certain, out of a certain stage, they will not be able to go beyond uh, a revenue like about 3 million or 4 million or 5 million, that's max. This is just like a yeah. hamster uh, running in the, uh, in their, its own cage. Yeah. So, so, so what is that, I mean, uh, a loop, I mean, it's kind of a mental block or what exactly is that? I mean, for a small business to not go, not able to go beyond certain size. It's interesting, you know, McKinsey's, I think, has done an analysis every year for decades about the main blockages of um, uh, sustainable growth trajectory for businesses. And they, they're the same every year. So for a business to go from here to here, you need to really um, look at seven areas and, and really try and unblock those blockages. So the first area is technology, artificial intelligence. Do you really have the right technology, the right artificial intelligence tools, the technology tools to take your business from here to here? Do you really have them? So you need to look at that. The next one is, do you have the right vision for your business? So maybe your vision is the wrong vision. Maybe you've set it too low. Maybe you've actually deluded yourself and set it too high. So you need to look at the technology vision. Then the third thing then is, do you have the right change management skills in your business? So to go from a small business to a bigger business, you need to have the right financial tools. You need to have the right marketing tools. You need to have the right people on board. It's, not e it's never easy to go from small business to business to big business. So technology, vision, change management. Another one then is, do you have the right engagement within your organization? Maybe not all members in your, of your business are thinking the same way. So engagement is the fourth one. The fifth one then is um, cohesion. Do you have the right cohesion? Is everybody pulling in the right direction in the business? Often when small businesses want to become business, big businesses, they go, a lot, a lot of small businesses are family businesses, right? And if you want to go from a small family business to a big business, there, there always comes a time when you have to bring outsiders in, investors in or uh, professional managers that is invariably the crunch point. That's when a lot of small businesses fail. So you need to plan all this. So that's, a, that, that's that thing. I guess the sixth thing then is communications. Are you communicating sufficiently externally your growth plan or are you, and also internally. So for example, if you want to move from being a small manufacturer of of, um, you know, um, latex beds, right? E ecological beds, you know, high-end ecological, not just foam, but good quality. Um, are you sufficiently communicating that um, by doing that, you're helping the environment, that you're providing luxury products, you're providing sustainable products? Because people won't buy a, a, a sustainable product unless you tell them it is. So you need to communicate. 
Um, so I think, I think that they're, they're the main things. And then number six, I think then is, um, you know, I think it's having that, are you the right leader yourself? Are you the right person? Because often, you know, s- small business owners have the passion in the early days, but they, it either burns out or, or maybe when it goes from here to here, um, you need to be honest with yourself and say, I'm not, I'm no longer the right person to run this business. I need somebody to help me or I need a consultant. That's why consultants make lots of money because they get called into businesses. So I think those seven areas, cohesion, communication, change management, the, having the right figurehead, vision, technology, engagement, there's a lot there. Um, but I think they're the main reasons why businesses fail to go from here to here. So very nice. I mean, that's a professional way uh, of uh, mentioning how to go to the next level. I got one question. I mean, one point here, I would like to correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, with small businesses, you did uh, brought about the finances. I mean, the important thing about the finance. My uh, assumption is I think uh, most of the small businesses, they convert that uh, small businesses, their lifestyle, I mean, uh, um, a business, and yep. they depend on that business for their personal revenues going forward. So that kind of, uh, that kind, uh, that kind of uh, uh, entanglement, I mean, kind of is a loop. Uh, yeah. So they will not, they are, as long as they're not able to separate, uh, separate the personal finances from the business, yeah. uh, probably they will not be able to grow. Probably you can throw some light on those, on that aspect, if you are, please. Uh, absolutely. It's critically important. Uh, well, there's two things to say about this. So the irony is, as a small business owner, your business brand and your personal brand are very intertwined. So they have to be intertwined. So, so for example, my business if you look at my LinkedIn website, LinkedIn and my website and all my social media, it's simonhaig.com, right? But my, my company is GCM Advisory, doc, doc, GCM Advisory Limited. So my company is GCM Advisory, but my personal brand is simonhaig.com. They're the same thing. And so, so that's intertwined. But you also have to be very, very clear that your, your personal finances are different to your business finances. A business is an individual entity in itself. You know, you need to think in terms of, I think you need to think in terms of one day, what's the exit strategy for my small business? So one day, could I sell this business? Could I sell this business? Could I do a merger? Could I collaborate with somebody? And, and if you're, so I think you've always got to think, what's the end goal, the exit strategy for my business? And therefore, you need to be very, very clear to keep your personal finances and your business finances very separate. So, so for example, for me, you know, my, so it, that's the difficulty because your brands are interlinked, but you need to keep the finances separate. So you just need to be very mindful daily of demarcating your brand and your finances. And I think it just takes a lot of discipline. It takes a lot of discipline. But I think if you think in terms of one day selling this business, I, how can I sell this business? and that's the ultimate goal, then you must force yourself to keep the finances separate. If you don't, it's going to be very hard to sell the business or do a mergers or an acquisition or a collaboration. So you just need to force yourself to keep the two things separate. That's very nice. Thank you very much on this particular topic. And, and uh, we also look at, you, you are a growth strategist. I mean, you uh, look at, you also mentioned in the beginning, you're mentoring uh, one lady in India. Uh, and you're talking about the confidence. And so how do you see the personal uh, gro- growth of an individual? I mean, what are the main important parameters for an individual to grow in their own career or business? Uh, okay. What do you get? Yeah. So what I, what I have created is what I call this. I, I use the number seven a lot, right? But I, it's called the seven steps to successful growth. So I've created a coaching and mentoring program and I have an online e-learning program on my website, simonhaig.com. And so what I do is, and it's very ambitious and it took me three years to put together this together. So when I coach somebody, the first session is an introductory session. So I ask them, I send them a, I send them a questionnaire and I ask them about them. What are their aspirations? What are their hopes? What are their goals? What are their blockages? What are their challenges? What are they good at? What are they not so good at? What are they worried about? What are they not confident about? So I try and get as much information as possible, right? And then I, I use that then to shape the first session, which is I look at, so there's an introductory session. That's number one. Number two then is I look at personal growth. So having take, taken that information, are they, are they looking at things like 
how resilient are they? Do they, do they, or how aware are they? Um, what's their ability to make confidence decisions? What's their judgment like? So I work on those personal growth things. And then the third session then is leadership growth. So, and, and these sessions build into each other. They're logically follow. So leadership of growth, I look at um, their ability to lead within the business, to lead others, to inspire, to create vision. Because you, there's a process around creating a vision. Not everybody can create a vision. And you need to be self-aware. You need to have done the work in the second session around personal growth to be able to create, create vision. Then the fourth session then is business growth. Having got that self-awareness and created the leadership vision, are they really looking at maximizing their business? Have they strategized? Are they planning? Do they look at the finances? All those things. Then the fifth area then is business brand. Have they really looked at what are they doing to maintain that reputation, that third leg of the stool through their business brand? And then the sixth session then is personal brand. Personal brand is so important. So that needs to be consistent. They need to be authentic. Have you thought about creating a legacy for your personal brand? So, so somebody like Marshall Goldsmith, the world's number one leadership thinker, people will know Marshall Goldsmith in a hundred years time. He's created a legacy. He's created a legacy. So, and I don't think enough people think about creating their own legacy, right? And then finally, I do a final wrap up session and I look at all of that stuff. So it's very in depth. And it's very um, thorough, but it's very important. It's like four pieces of a jigsaw, business, leadership, brand, and personal growth, and they all come together. That's so important. It's very nice. Okay. So, I mean, you, you said I mean, the confidence is another important parameter in this uh, whole thing. So how yep. much is the uh, confidence plays in the role of a success or any in, in individual? How do they get a confidence? I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, some people can be more confident or are some people kind of a little uh, pessimistic. So how do we strike a balance uh, here on the confidence side? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And there's no easy answer to that, right? So, so for example, I've gone on my own confidence journey, right? And I talked before about, I use this term matching your confidence with your capability. So I've always been very capable. I got good results at school. I've written books, but I was never as confident as I thought I should have been, right? And it was only earlier this year that Marshall Goldsmith said to me, you should be reaching out and you should connect with global thought leaders and do podcasts, which is what I've done this year, okay? And by doing that, and I run events and summits now, and I'm kind of operating in that area with global thought leaders, I've now realized that I should have been more confident. I should have been more confident. And so the answer is that lack of confidence is always in our own head, right? We create, we create our own lack of self-confidence. I think part of the problem is social media and also societal constraints, right? In certain societies, for example, you know, it's harder for women to be on an equal level as men. And um, in certain societies, it's harder for older people to see it as much as younger people. Um, I think it's very difficult in those kind of environments, but I think, I think, you know, I think it's very important to demarcate. There's a difference between us as individuals and our skills. So there's seven and a half billion people in this world, seven and a half billion people. Every single one of those people is the best version of themselves. You're the best version of you. I, I will never be as good at being you as you, right? You will always be the yeah, best version of you. Sure. Yes. And, yeah. and I will always be the best version of me. You could never be better than me at being me. And so every seven and a half billion people in this world, whether they're whatever culture, whatever religion, whether they're, you know, they, are, they have mental issues or physical issues, we are all equal, 100% equal, right? But there's a difference between us as human beings and our skills, right? And so some of us are more skilled than others, but it doesn't mean we're worse people. We're all 100% the best version of ourselves. And I think the problem is that society and social media mixes up us and our skills. And I think that's the problem. If, we all, if every human being on this planet realized that they're the best version of themselves, confidence levels would go up, right? <laughs> so I think it's important to, to make the difference in your own mind for people watching and listening that everybody watching, nobody is better than that person. 
They might be better at, at certain skills, but they're not better as a human being. And so start from that perspective and build your skills. That's important. It's very nice, very nice. I mean, and do you uh, uh, mean to say, I mean, you, everybody has their own skills and uh, they should not compare themselves to the others. And, yes. And, and, I mean, and, and uh, you, whether you're right or wrong, I mean, be true true to yourself be yourself and then and then express yourself some people most of the people what i've seen is i mean correct me if i'm wrong i mean they lack some communication skills yeah. they have the thoughts in their mind they don't know how to express them so yeah. they side they become silent and so over a period of time they kind of i mean lose the confidence of expressing themselves yeah. so how yeah. do they overcome that those kind of challenges you're right. Communication is so powerful. Like, I mean, it's very, very powerful. And again, there's no easy answer to this other than to say that um, the, the good thing to say is that 93% of communication across nearly all cultures, 93% is not what we talk to each other about. So you and I are looking at each other, right? 93% of my communication with you is the way you look, the way you're blinking, the way you're nodding with me. You're nodding a lot, right? And I nod back. You smile a lot, right? That's what I notice, right? 93% is not the verbal, it's not oral. And so that should give people confidence that we can connect with each other 93%. We don't even need to talk, you know? When you smile with another, when we both smile with each other, right? We're connecting. Our, our souls connect, right? And the same applies in business, right? Now, having said that, you also need to have the skill set to determine whether somebody is lying to you. Because not everybody is good. Not everybody is as good as you, right? And people, there are professional liars, right? There are con artists, there are scammers, there are liars. So I think you need to, A, to have that awareness that body language is so important and you could, that's very, very powerful. Secondly, you need to be very aware of how you can determine whether somebody is being honest or not with you. And broadly speaking, there are two ways of finding, there are direct ways. So direct ways of finding out whether somebody is, is lying to you is ask them lots of questions and then you can find inconsistencies. Um, people who lie to you tend to say I less, they tend to use less self-reference. People who lie to you, they tend to be a bit more negative. So they're direct ways and then indirect ways if somebody's holding their hands a lot, this is generally across cultures, it's a, there's a chance they're covering stuff up, right? If they're not looking at you in the eyes, if they're not smiling back. So you're not lying to me because you look at me in the eyes and you're smiling a lot. I feel very comfortable. So it's important to say that because a lot of people think it's just about the spoken word. It's not. Now, the spoken word is very important, but people can do business through other forms of communication. So it's a, it's a complicated area. Um, but just be very mindful that you can communicate and you can read communications in all sorts of ways. Perfect. I mean, that's very nice. I mean, yeah, there are many songs also, like you're beautiful the way you are and those kind of things. I will give you the confidence for the yes. people. So you're, yeah, this is right. Everybody is good on their own. So yes. even the musicians also made those uh, points yeah. in their, expressed in their own way, which is nice. Yeah. Coming back to the uh, in general in the business environment, uh, I mean, many businesses, some businesses are growing and thriving. And on the other side, the big corporations are also closing down. I mean, like, uh, uh, so, so you're being a growth strategist. What do you think, I mean, uh, these large companies are missing? And then, I mean, uh, uh, some of them, not everybody, I mean, some companies are growing and some companies are failing. I mean, in spite of having a success and seeing a lot of money, I mean, billions of money, uh, billions of dollars of money. So yeah. what is that they are missing? What should a company, a small business or a big company should do uh, to stay focused and uh, grow gradually? Yep, yeah. that, that's a very big question. So I've mentioned purpose before. Purpose is so important. And, and, you know, people talk about, certain consultants talk about you must have a vision, mission, and values, right? But the most important thing for a business is purpose. So what that means is that, you know, Apple and Google and um, Microsoft and Amazon, they're all growing, right? Because they serve a deep purpose, right? So 
Amazon is a great example. It's, that, there's a, Amazon are very, very lucky this year because, because of COVID, you know, deliveries are rocketing. So the purpose for, of Amazon is to satisfy that requirement for delivery. That's easy, right? Um, so that's an easy example. Even good businesses um, have a purpose. So for example, you know, I'll give you an example, um, you know, BP, right? BP has a purpose of, of getting oil out of the ground and, and feeding the whole industry around oil, okay? But I've mentioned the three-legged stool. Even if a business has a good purpose, it still always needs to be mindful of the three R's, right? So BP, remember a few years ago, there was a fire in the Gulf of Mexico, right? And so it didn't look after the risk. And then the way it managed the announcement afterwards, it wasn't a very good way of managing it. So it didn't, ma- ma- didn't look after its reputation. So, so to answer your question, businesses survive because they have or, or thrive because they are very mindful of their purpose. They're constantly looking at it. Amazon is constantly looking at its purpose. Every week it's looking at its purpose. And also it's constantly looking at those three R's, revenue, risk, reputation, revenue, risk, reputation, revenue, risk, reputation, every week, every month. And, um, and so I call, it, it's, I call it strategic serendipity, right? Some people say some businesses are lucky. Some people would say Amazon is lucky. COVID's arrived, it's lucky. It's not lucky. Businesses are successful because they work hard every day. They, 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 they analyze opportunities. They constantly refine and change their purpose because they listen to the market. They listen to the market all the time and, and they keep balancing the three R's. And by doing that, they create what's called strategic serendipity. They give themselves the best chance to thrive. So I think that's what, that's what differentiates thriving businesses from other businesses. They balance the purpose and the three R's constantly. That's very important. Very nice. And see, so that's, uh, you covered many topics today from the small business to the personal uh, growth and uh, personal confidence and then the growth strategies. So anything else you want to cover in the growth strategy point, which I missed that? I think the only thing just to say is that, uh, and I'm, I'm, I've mentioned I've written three books in the past and I'm writing two more books. And the latest book is about what I call the growth journey, right? We're all on a growth journey. I'm not going to give the full name of the, t- the book away, but it's coming next year. And there are two main types of growth in our lives. There's outer growth and there's inner growth. So outer growth means that, you know, we can earn money, we can make revenue in a business, we can drive a nice car, we sleep in a nice bed, we live in a nice house. They're the outer growth things. They're finite. Outer growth is always finite. You can only drive one car at a time. You can only sleep in one bed at a time, right? Um, Whereas inner growth inside us, that's infinite. Nobody has yet found how deep the human soul is. Nobody has found how strong human resilience is. Nobody has found out how aware we can become. So I think it's so important for us to think more about our inner growth than our outer growth. And if we focus on our inner growth, on becoming honest about becoming um, less judgmental about becoming willing, about becoming resilient, self-aware, situationally aware, then the outer growth things will come, right? If you just focus on the outer growth things, they won't be sustainable. So I think for me, it's about really focusing on inner growth. And, and I've seen it myself. This year, I've worked more on helping people with their inner growth and I'm seeing huge opportunities coming in from a business perspective. Whereas for years... I would be focusing on, I need to chase this deal. I need to do this. And I used to be rubbing my head thinking, why is it not happening? Things happen if you focus on the inner growth. So I wanted to say that that's important. So very important. So you're kind of blending the philosophy or uh, uh, spiritual kind of thing. Yes. With the, uh, with, uh, that's a very, yes. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Whether it's, whether it's Buddhist, whether it's whatever religion or for me, it's not about religion. It's about spirituality. It's about, having that awareness that the universe is bigger than like, I'm just, there's seven and a half billion people on this planet. We're tiny, tiny little dots in the universe. Right. 
And so none of us is that important, right? None of us is that significant. And, the, you, and there is a higher power. There is a force out there. But it's within all of us. You know, whether you call it God or Buddha or Yahweh or whatever, that's within all of us. All of us have that. And yet so many of us don't think in those terms. And there's so much strength and there's so much ability to succeed in business if you tap into the inner resources. Yeah, that's very nice. I mean, I mean, when you brought in all these uh, the spiritual leaders, I mean, uh, uh, they always say that come to the middle. I mean, like, I mean, uh, uh, stay middle. I mean, stay focused yes. and stay middle. I mean, so yeah. probably that would be the key thing, probably you're referring to that. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. So any, uh, do you want to, I know you're written, I mean, uh, you're a five-star author and you've written a few books. Do you want to mention about your books here, please? Yeah, so I wrote a book 20 years ago um, when I was a lawyer called Contract Law in an E-Commerce Age. So it was how e-commerce and mobile commerce is changing the whole area of business and contracts. And so that was the first book. And then the second book I wrote five years ago, and I was fortunate to have Marshall Goldsmith, who's the world's number one leadership thinker. He wrote the foreword to that book, and that was called Deal Making for Corporate Growth. So it's all about how corporates can um, maximize their ability to create, de- create, identify, create deals and close deals. And then last year, at the beginning of last year, I was blessed. Marshall Goldsmith came to Ireland and he launched my third book, which is called How to Be a Better Deal Closer. And it's available on Amazon. Amazon Island, I know Professor M.S. Rao, who lives in India, wrote a review of the book, um, How to Be a Better Deal Closer. Um, and really that's, I build upon the previous book, deal making for corporate growth, but in how to be a better deal closer, I talk, I talk about the seven P's principles, planning players, power performance, um, putting it all to bed. And then what I call payout or post-mortem. So I put a process to help people identify, um, create, develop and close deals. But also I, help people look at the core inner strength skills that they need to become good deal makers like resilience, self-awareness, et cetera. So they're the three current books. And then I'm currently writing two more books. One, as I said, about the growth journey. And another one is going to be a transcript of conversations I'm having with some global thought leaders. So they're coming soon. It's very nice. So if somebody would like to reach out to you, how can they reach you? Yeah, so um, they can reach me on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn every day. You'll see me post every day. So Simon Haig at LinkedIn, H-A-I-G-H, Simon Haig, um, or my website, simonhaig.com. Um, I'm also on Twitter, uh, Facebook, Instagram, but mainly LinkedIn and through my website. Very nice. So any final words to the audience? I think I think the main thing is just to... As you go through life, and I found this out, I'm 53 this year, and I found this out in the last couple of years, is that we, we all have to deal with other people. We all have to work with people. We all have to go into business with people. We all have to collaborate. And I think there are three things that I've figured out, particularly when you want to collaborate with people, is, and you need to force yourself to, to do these, is ask yourself, do I like this person? Number one, do I like this person? right? Don't rush into things. Ask yourself, do I like this person? Number two, do I trust this person? And number three, do I respect this person? And if you say yes to yourself to all three, then there's a good chance there'll be a good opportunity. If your gut feeling, because don't forget, our, my brain is 53 years old. My mind is 53 years old, but my gut feeling is tens of thousands of years old because the human gut feeling comes from the evolution of all humankind. So that's why our gut feeling is so strong. Uh, So I think I'll I'll finish with this, that rely on your gut feeling as much, if not more, than your head. If something feels wrong in your gut, then chances are it's wrong. So the best deal makers and negotiators use the gut feeling. Now, they don't just use the gut feeling. They use the head as well. But there's such power in your gut feeling. That's how I finish. Thank you very much, Mr. Simon Haig, for coming onto the show and sharing your uh, uh, expertise and wisdom. And have a nice rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Same here. Thank you, sir. Have a nice Thank day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.